Let's welcome her to the program. She has her own fitness brand as well as her nutrition and mental health brand titled Hannah Healthy. Let's welcome her to the program, Hannah Stone. Hey, Hannah, welcome to the program. Hello. So happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us on the program. Let's get right to it. Every story has a beginning. What was your upbringing like growing up? Well, I grew up in a, in Israel. I grew up in a super, super orthodox family in Israel. And um, it's not like a regular like family in Israel. It was very orthodox. So it's a very small percentage of Israel um, has those kind of... Uh, restrictions and and orthodox so it's it's kind of like it was very culty like a bubble no one leaves no one goes in and out like no radio no tv no internet so um very similar to you know a cult and not really able to see the world and what's out there you know wow i want to stay with your upbringing for a moment you mentioned about your upbringing in israel and the whole orthodox way of how you were reared you can delve more into detail about this. We know about life in the Middle East is very different, and we know about so many people that are from the Middle East. They come to America to pursue the American dream. I wanted to ask you, before you came to America, what were your images like of America? Did you see it as achieving the American dream, the land of opportunity? What were your visions of America before you came to American soil? Yeah, so my dad is actually originally from America, so I had uh, my father, my father's side here in America and um, have, you know, my two sisters live here. But I always knew growing up that I'm not going to stay in Israel just because um, it's tough living there, you know. Uh, and so to me, like, I always wanted to be in America also because the family I have here I feel more close to. Um, and also because, yes, definitely the the freedom and just being able to pursue whatever it is that I want to do, although it's not something I had in mind uh, when I was growing up because I didn't know much about it. When I was growing up, it's just like I wanted to just not be religious. That was my only thing that I uh, that I cared about. And, um, you know, the fact that my family were here and I have some family that I'm a little closer to that I got a little bit more warmth from, um, that's what made me to want to come here. And then, obviously, when I came here, I... I saw all the benefits of the having the freedom and the you know pursuing the you know not go not following the regular society because uh, in Israel it's very like uh, everybody kind of like doing the same thing uh, mostly so yeah it was different and that's it. You mentioned that your father is American. When you were growing up, did you have any thing to ask him about America? Did he tell you things about America on how it was? a polar opposite from Israel? Well, not really. I honestly wasn't. We, in our family, because of my parents both became religious, they, there wasn't, it was all about like the religion for them. So there was not really communication nor between them or to, with the kids. So there was nothing like, I, I felt like I'm not really connected to my parents. I don't really know them. I don't really know where they came from and, or what they did and what got them into going into where they, you know, decided to go to. Um, so I didn't talk to him about it. However, I, I have a aunt, like she's my, my dad's sister, and my grandparents used to come a lot, like every two years to Israel. And when they came from America, they came with all these gifts and they had like this special smell and my 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 aunt was like very free spirit and she came with her partner and their little dog and just like it was like a glimpse of freedom that 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 I saw growing up from them you know so it attracted me to I guess like subconsciously it was there that really called me to you know go there one day awesome and I have to ask you about this you got a taste of America from your dad's sister, your aunt, and, of course, from your grandparents. Do you remember the first American food that you tried, and did you like it? Well, I, you know, and one thing I noticed that um, in Israel, there's not much, like, Mexican food, uh, and here it's pretty big, like tacos, for example. I remember I tried taco for the first time. 
Um, and yeah, of course, I really, really liked it. But then I obviously realized that it can go to like whatever directions. But I never really tried like the, you know, the real American food, like the, I mean, just like the, the fatty, the, all the things that are, you know, I don't know, chicken and waffles or, you know, like big burgers. And I mean, I tried burgers, but not like from the regular, you know, uh, like uh, popular chains. I didn't try those kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. I feel like because when I moved to the U.S., I was on a, on my health journey. So I was really already noticing like what I'm eating and what I'm putting in my body. All right. And I just want to stay again with food for a moment. You mentioned, again, talking about your Middle Eastern upbringing in Israel. And I know just the Middle Eastern upbringing alone is primarily about the Mediterranean diet and eating a lot of fresh fruit, particularly with dates, figs, and a lot of olive oil. What are some of your favorite Israeli foods that you enjoy eating? Oh, my God. I can go on and on for a long time. So, first of all, the, you know, in Israel, like, what's really common to eat for breakfast, for example, it's a lot of salads with eggs and, um, you know, some cheese. I mean, but not just, like, it, it's, like, um, like kind of, like, it's, it's different kind of cheese, like cottage cheese and, you know, stuff in, like, that like that sort. Uh, tuna, they eat a lot of tuna for breakfast, too. And uh, also for dinner, they eat that. And then lunch usually is, like, the little heavier meal. But I really like to make a lot of Mediterranean style food. So I would make like shakshuka. So it's basically like tomatoes with like uh, onions and then you put like eggs on top and you make it in like a, a, a like a pan with like the lid on and, and like you eat it with like a bread and hummus and I really love hummus. I love to make like shawarma from, you know, I could make it with like tea uh, for vegan version or I could make it with like chicken thighs or chicken breast or even chicken liver. So it's kind of like the similar like Mediterranean seasoning. So I really like to use those seasonings for different things. I could make like a bowl or a salad or whatever that you can think of, like a wrap or a sandwich, but like with those flavors. So, yeah, I, I really love to make a lot of these things for for my meals. But, of course, you can go to a healthy version with it or to like a less healthy version uh, with it. Wow, it sounds delicious. All of that sounds right up my alley with the shawarma and, of course, with the hummus and also just the the great salads, man. Definitely delicious. It definitely it's a, a refre- it's a hearty, but it's a very healthy uh, type of diet. Certainly, I recommend people should eat more of those meals. It's delicious. And you mentioned about mm-hmm. coming over from Israel to America and getting on your fitness journey. So how did your fitness journey begin? When I um, when I was in the Army, I was in the Army in Israel because it's mandatory to go to the Army. So I was there, and the second year that I was in the Army, I came to uh, visit my family here in the U.S., my sister and my brother-in-law, and I was smoking cigarettes at the time. I know, shocking. <laughs> I was smoking cigarettes at the time because it's very popular in Israel, especially in the Army. If you don't smoke cigarettes, you're probably going to find yourself not, you know, pretty bored, like not with all the people, you know, when there's a break and everybody sits and smoking cigarettes. So when I came here, my my sister, my brother-in-law told me, listen, if you want to come to the U.S., you're going to have to stop smoking cigarettes because we don't want the nicotine in our couch and we just don't want that. So you're going to have to stop for a month when you come here. So I was like in my head, okay, I'm just going to stop for a month, no problem. I'm just going to go back to Israel and I'm going to go back to smoking cigarettes because at the time I had no awareness and I, I didn't really care because I didn't really, you know, coming from where I came from, no one were like talking about health or about like nutrition or anything of that sort. So it wasn't something that I was interested about because I wasn't aware of it. And then when I came here and I ate healthy, I I started really liking it. I really liked for First of all, I realized that, oh, healthy food can actually taste really good. And also, when I went back to Israel, I I really noticed how good it makes me feel, like physically and emotionally, too, and mentally. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to continue to eat healthy. So I started with, like, eating healthy, uh, cleaner, more like salads, more like veggies, like the, the basic health that people talk about. 
And and then I later went while I was in the army, I was like, okay, I I I can use the resources I have in the army and you know get into fitness too. So let me get into it. And I got into fitness at the first, you know, in the beginning I had no idea what I'm doing, but you know, with time I started learning, and then I decided to later down the road to make it more, you know, to learn more and make it like professional and get certified just just for my own knowledge. But um. Yeah, I feel like even when in the beginning when I ate healthy, like now, looking back to that, with my fitness and my nutrition, even though I thought I was eating healthy and I was I thought that I was working out and all that, I was not really because I I got to a point where I was hitting a plateau. Uh I couldn't see any more results. So, you know, there were a lot of problems with like ingredients that I was consuming in the quote unquote healthy food, you know, the marketing is sometimes really good in our society and something that says like zero calorie or zero sugar, it can actually be very harmful in terms of ingredients. So no awareness around ingredients. Also, I had no awareness around like macronutrients. So obviously all of these adds up and, you know, on top of the fact of just like doing random workouts and not performing what I should do according to where I'm at and where I'm trying to get to, you know, yeah. It's interesting. I, I want to touch back on two points just for a moment. Smoking cigarettes, and you mentioned that you did duty with the Israeli army. Smoking, is that like a, a cultural norm, not just in Israel, or is it just amongst within the army? It's definitely a cultural thing because I started smoking when I was 16, um, way earlier than the army. I joined the army when I was 19. So it's very definitely a cultural thing in Israel. If you walk in the streets, like you smell cigarettes everywhere. Uh, I think I think all of Europe is more um, is more into it uh, in general. But um, yeah, in the army, I feel like it's definitely like if there is someone that didn't smoke cigarettes before the army, a lot of people start smoking in the army. All right, and I just want to stay with the Israeli army for a moment. You've said that it's mandatory to join the Israeli army. I have to ask you this. Were you, are there, I know you may not be able to say some of this because this could be classified information, but mandatory. What were your, did you get a letter in the mail saying that you were selected to be in, in the, to go, to be a member of the Israeli army or did you have to go to some type of training how how does that work how do you get selected for service like that because you said it was mandatory can you go more into detail about that yes of course uh yeah so first of all in a regular family in israel like everybody gets a letter when they're 16 that in two years you're going to have to join the army so it's basically the first i don't know how to call it but there's a name to it that that basically you get invited to come in However, where I came from, I came from a super, super orthodox family, and in the orthodox family, the women, especially the women, they don't even get, you know, the this letter. The men do get this letter, but they usually come up with creative ways to get out of there. Um, but, uh, you know, as women, like, I actually didn't get it. So, but when I left the religion and, you know, I went on my own, I left my parents' house when I was 14, and um, I left the religion officially when I was 16. So by the time I got to age, you know, 18 or 17 even, like when I was basically 16, I was already out. I knew that I wanted to go to the army because I knew that I'm not religious. And I knew that I need to be like, you know, just like fit in the society of, of my country and do what everybody is doing in my country. And it's going to the army when you're 18. So I actually went to this place uh, that, um, you know, I actually didn't, I, I decided to go. So um, I went and did it, and, uh, and yeah, and I joined when I was 19 because there was a little bit more uh, time. But, yeah, sometimes you join a little later. But, yes, everybody everybody gets uh, the this letter to go. It's just easier for the women to cancel it, actually, because even the women are getting it now that I'm thinking of it. But the women are, it's super easy to just go and cancel it. You just go and cancel it in this, like, um, uh, the place that you go to. Uh, and for the men, it's a little bit more complex, but they still get 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 away with it. 
most most of them, not all of the religious people, because some there's a lot of religious people that do go to the army, but the extreme ones, the very, very extreme ones, kind of like where I came from, it's um they get away with it. Mm, interesting. Thank you for explaining that, because when you said earlier that it's mandatory that not just men, but even the women that live in the country of Israel, they have to, it's mandatory that they join the Israeli army. How many years of service did you commit to being in the army? So women go for two years, men go for three years. Gener- like That's like the base. If you want to become an officer or if you want to sign for more, that's like an option too. Or if I am a woman who uh, is going to be a warrior, I'm going to be for three years, you know, so it depends. What was your position in the Israeli army? I was an operational driver. driver. I, like, drove the Humvees, and I was, like, in a officer's industry in artillery base. So, uh, you know, I went to the field with them, did exercises with them, uh, with the uh, uh, artillery, and, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of learning experience, a lot of discipline, a lot of learning how to function under pressure, how, how, under, you know, stress, and, um, yeah, I learned, definitely learned a lot. It was a good good decision to join the Army. Oh, wow. You definitely uh, cut your teeth, and you, like you said, you learned a lot, whether it be being under stress or just skills, and definitely that led the way for what you currently uh, do. We're going to get into what you currently do in just a little bit, but it's fascinating. I want to stay just with your military background. You mentioned growing up in Israel, and you grew up in a very religious home, Orthodox, and we know that in America, Title IX was introduced in the early 70s that allowed women to compete in sports where you had schools and uh, various uh, recreation programs that allowed women to compete. I wanted to ask you, again, due to strict religious backgrounds, you and your siblings weren't really able to go outside and play and things of that nature. Did your fitness background, or should I say your introduction to sports, start when you got into the military, or was it before that? Uh, Definitely when I got into the military, because before that, where I came from, there's no such thing as sports. Like, women are not allowed allowed to even ride, um, like, a bicycle. It's Everything is not allowed, especially for women, but also for men, uh, because they're like supposed to study the Bible all day. So doing that, those kind of activities, like they believe that it's gonna distract them or something. Uh, but yeah, definitely not for women. So I definitely got exposed to it when I was in the army. In my basic training in the army, it was more like light things, just like general, you know, a little bit of Krav Maga, if you heard of that, um, and a little bit of, uh, you know, just like basic basic training stuff but i didn't go too much in depth in my basic training because i wasn't like a warrior so i i just um uh did the basic training as basic training it's like four months and uh yeah all right awesome thank you for your a detailed explanation of that and so we talked about your upbringing in israel we talked about your military background we also got into detail about how your fitness journey began, and now let's get into personal training. So how did you get involved in the world of personal training? Yeah, when I was, when, when in 2018, I was working out probably for um, four years at the time, like since, since 2014 till 2018, I was working out for four years, um, you know, just for fun. I really loved it. I was super passionate about it. But I got to a point where I was, like, hitting a plateau, and that's when, in 2018, I was like, you know what, maybe I should go get certified, just for me to know what I'm doing, not necessarily to do something with it, just for me to know what I'm doing, because I felt like I'm just, like, doing random stuff. And that's when I went and I got NASM certified, and I got Body Design University uh, certified, which is um, an actual, uh, you know, university for basically um uh fitness and like you know course like for personal training and nutrition kinesiology a lot of things and it's actually in atlanta so there's a, it's actually physical like i went there and the reason i i decided to choose that as well is because i i came from israel so i was very not confident with my language with my english 
so I feel felt like I needed something to sit in class and just like be more hands on and not just doing the online NASM because you know NASM book is very it's like 700 pages and it's very like high words that I never heard in my entire life so definitely taking the course really helped me with going through NASM and yeah I did I did some extra things with NASM like uh, balance training and uh, women's specialist training, so really working with women in all stages of life, basically, you know, prenatal, postnatal, um, you know, menopause, and uh, did some uh, uh, plant-based also, a mini plant-based certification, more about, like, plant-based specifically. And, yeah, and I, I started doing that, and then I started working at gyms so I started with like personal training studios like I would I would teach like small groups of of people for classes and then I worked at Lifetime for a while I I worked at uh gyms in Vegas I was in Vegas at the time uh for 6 years uh so I worked in gyms and then I worked like one on one as well and then you know covid hit in 2020 and they closed the gyms and that's where I had to go to um, Zoom or like to go on Zoom and start training on uh, through Zoom like one on one, and then about a year and a half ago, I took a course for um, coaches basically, so how to do everything online, and that's what I've been doing for the past year, a little bit over a year ago, and uh, I was I was pretty shocked to see how it works because. I was pretty skeptical about it in the beginning, and then when I saw that how it actually works and how my clients see the results, even if it's online, you know, I even work with people in Israel, work with people all over the U.S., and, you know, giving them nutrition and fitness program and the accountability and the support and the education and the mental health part, all these things are kind of, like, I'm focusing on. The, obviously, the base thing for me is the, the mindful eating. That's, like, my, my niche because, you know, in the beginning of the time, I was like just like a regular fitness and nutrition coach. I would just do like regular fitness and nutrition uh, programs for people. However, that's why I thought that I don't know if it's something I want to do forever because I I just don't I just don't it's not very I don't I don't feel like it's my purpose. I don't feel like it's like that you know. And when I went through my emotional eating, I really really like start learning about that and there's a lot that goes into it because when I started my fitness journey I was very much uh, suffering from emotional eating even though I was very good with like restricting myself and counting my calories and all that I was still struggling with emotional eating and then when I really uh, learned how to overcome it I realized that this is my focus and that's what I'm focusing on with my clients today and that's when I know okay that is my purpose It, it, it was not clear before so long answer (laughs) no it wasn't long at all and thank you for going into a detailed explanation about that i want i'm going to get into your battle with emotional eating in just a little bit but i want to piggyback to you being involved in the world of personal training you mentioned about you getting you being you're earning your licenses and certifications can you go more into detail about the organizations where you received your licenses and certifications from? Yes. So I I did NASM. Uh, It's um, National Academic Sports Medicine. And so basically it's uh, really going into a lot with, with, you know, kinesiology, um, you know, some nutrition as well that I did there. Um, There's a lot of, you know, how to – move like the phases of 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 training it's like the the three phases of training that we went through and then you know with the body design university it's um it was really going into like details of like uh it was like two weeks long hands on uh you know we did like some real uh exercises that we actually saw it in real life and also we went through like each subject which is uh, which is was uh, kinesiology. Um, there was another thing I don't remember the word in English, but you know some nutrition, some uh, you know the the uh, the science that behind like exercising, and you know a lot that goes into details with like just exercise science and um, how to you know, and the, with the nutrition, with the right nutrition. So we did, like, real-life exercises and with the nutrition and with the 
the, um, uh, you know, with the workout programs, how to build workout, how to work with people, how to, you know, uh, work around injuries. Um, yeah, like all, all of the things. Wow, that's awesome. That's very thorough and, very, and the information that you provided on that is awesome. I want to stay with kinesiology. Can you explain to the listeners out there what the study of kinesiology is all about? It's just the body, like the how the body works. Um, just like, you know, about the muscles, just going deeper into the muscles, the joints, the really to go deeper into understanding how the body works and different muscles and di- muscle types, you know. Uh, there there are a lot that goes into, like, different, what like, what exercises you do that works different muscle types. And, you know, about, like, how you, you know, how you want to do the right thing in terms of your fitness program to support your fitness goals with doing the right exercise program. So, for example, things that are more cardio-based and things that are more, um, you know, uh, strength training-based and how to basically understanding the the heart rate and all these things that really understanding what it is that you need to do. Like, for example, a lot of people think that getting, like, super high-intensity workouts is what's going to help them to lose the weight. Like, yes, you definitely burn more calories. Overall, you definitely burn more calories. However, when you're in zone three, four, and five, where, you know, in a heart rate zone, three, four, and five, you burn more calories. However, you don't burn any calories from fat. So if you want to focus on weight loss, for example, you actually want to go to zone one and two, which is you burn less calories overall, but you burn more calories from fat. So it's really like understanding everything about it. It was like years ago. So, you know, there's a lot that I probably – you know, every two years I'm going uh, back and doing kind of like a refresher for for um, for my certification, and uh, so yeah, I mean it's a lot of things about the the muscles and you know a lot of things that you know sometimes you learn things and you don't remember exactly like every single um, muscle type, but you know if I kind of like go over it like every two years, it kind of like refreshing the memory around around that. Wow, that's awesome. Again, thank you again for that detailed explanation of that. And you mentioned about getting in when you began your journey into personal training, you mentioned about emotional eating. This is something that a lot of people struggle with, not just women, but there's even um, we've seen some recent occurrences with men that struggle with emotional eating. And we know how food, how addictive it can be. And we also know that food is a comfort. We know that food there's a coping mechanism in more ways than one, good, bad, positive, negative, and things of that nature. If you would like to share this story, trying to adjust to life in America or maybe personal or professional issues, where did your your battle with – how did your battle with emotional eating start and how did you conquer it? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And so when I – developed the emotional eating and I know it's going to sound a little weird and crazy but I actually started developing that when I was created inside my mom's womb and the reason I'm saying it is because I am uh, I've been doing therapy for the past three and a half years and we did a lot of um, work with guided imagery and going back to the time that I was the first time that I was basically kind of like protecting myself and Using that as as a uh, source of warmth and love, and it's something that I didn't feel from the first moment. And but my first memory around that is when I was ten, like, and it also came up with my therapies. When I was ten, I was, um, you know, we grew up in a house that was very cold. There was no warmth, no love, and I remember I used to steal money from my mom. Um, probably not a good thing, uh, but, you know, I would feel a little bit like here and there, like five shekels, ten shekels, you know, just to go and buy my, myself some candies. I would just go and use this money to buy candies, and I would buy, like, full bags of ca- candies, and then I would eat it, like, secretly in a place that no one can see it, because obviously if people would see it. It would be like, where did you get all this, like, um, you know, money from, from for the for these candies? 
And I, I remember me sitting and eating it and feeling like this warmth and love, but I also felt like very, very guilt because um, I knew that it's not okay. I knew that it's not okay that I stole this money. So for me, that was like the first experience that I experienced how like for me like love and, and, and food was under the topic of guilt. And I, I, that really affected me. And, you know, later it's like almost like the, the food for me all like since, since the day I can remember myself, it was for me a huge escape to get some warmth and love because I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't really aware of it until I started therapy three and a half years ago. And then when I started therapy, I realized that like, wow, I actually, I have this, because I was always like really restricting myself and like with calories and I thought that this is normal. I thought that, oh, if I'm working out and if I want to achieve my results and if I want to lose the weight, I have to restrict myself and count my calories. And that's where I feel like I was definitely mistaken and I feel like a lot of people are mistaken because I work with people until this day that they're restricting themselves and they're counting calories, but they, they feel like, they feel like um, they think that they're doing something good, but that's when you know the the it's it's really unhealthy for your mental health, and it's really also just being disconnected from your body. So in my journey, I learned how to be more connected to my body and realize and understanding my hunger and finding the different hunger types. And each hunger type is like for different things. And there is a real hunger, and there is hunger that is just either a pattern or comes from, like, sadness or stress or boredom or, you know, just kind of like um, um, craving for the cause from something. So usually there is something, like a reason that makes you want to binge, that's a reason that makes you want to have the urge to, to snack or the urge to have something sweet. And, and there, you're right, there are so many people in the world that are struggling with it, but a lot of people are not even aware of it. And that's the thing where instead of trying to restrict yourself and put yourself on, on meal plans and restrict yourself with calories and this is not allowed and carbs are bad and sugars are bad and all these things, it's like diet culture basically. Diet culture. Bottom line is diet culture. So instead of focusing on what you want to remove from your diet, it's focusing on what you want to add to your diet and, and focusing on really being tuned with your body. So understanding the root cause of what makes you want to binge right now. What is it that, that, that triggers you right now? What, what happened? And that's the root cause. That's the, basically, I call it the foundation of everything that most of the fitness industry completely ignores it. And when you dive deeper into the root, what caused you to want to binge right now, that's when you understand that you actually need to work on something else here. It has no relation to stricting yourself with food. It's something that you need that you completely don't notice it and you, you don't give yourself the space for it to really dive deeper into it and, and, and just be compassionate with yourself and sit with it. And then the, usually what people do is just to cope it with eating, whether if it's sweet, savory, it doesn't matter. But that's when, um, you know, it's just like a lot of people are like completely numb when it comes to emotional eating and or they just don't know what to do with it because there's not enough information out there that comes to emotion, mindful eating, basically, mindful eating. Uh, again, thank you for explaining that. And definitely it can, as you said, that you've been going to therapy and you continue to receive therapy, I guess, for the trauma that you faced during your childhood. You mentioned about not receiving any love and warmth and very religious type of environment, but I'm glad that you have acknowledged that and you continue to acknowledge that and that you're going through not just with the therapy, but most importantly, finding out about healthy ways to cope with stress and trauma and also to bringing a positive light on healthy eating and not diets and being very restrictive. So thank you again for uh, going into detail about that. And I want to talk now about your training. How often do you train and how many hours and days a week? That's a great question. I used to train seven days a week, and I used to spend two and a half hours at the gym every single day. And the reason I used to do that is because it's definitely not the right way. Uh, I definitely was hitting a plateau. I was overtraining. I was not recovering properly. I had inflammation. I had, like, a lot of issues. And um, also it just became, like, a super obsessive thing for me. 
And now, the way I do it now is I will work out between four to six times a week. It really depends on the week and how my body feels. Really, really learning to listening to my body. Uh, and I try to walk every day for like an hour. So I do usually um, four uh, strength training per week. And then I'll add one or two uh, high intensity. Um, yeah, but usually four train, uh, strength training one high intensity and and walking and really really depends because sometimes some weeks I feel more my body's need like needs more rest and really really learning to like listen to my body for real awesome and now I want to ask you while we're talking about training what are your favorite body parts to train oh I love training glutes and I love training uh heat I love high intensity core training, like a lot of ab focus. Uh, so I really like, you know, I, I love to kind of like come up with like creative movements that are very, very complex. I love using the BOSU ball, the the stability ball. I love doing balance stuff. So to really work on core. So I would say core and glutes for sure. Awesome. And then, you know, earlier we talked about the diet. We talked about specifically one of the things that we mentioned was about the foods that are eaten in Israel, or specifically the Mediterranean diet. What does your diet primarily consist of? That's a great question. I am doing uh, right now just listening to my body, whatever I feel like eating, and I'll explain it in a second. But I do want to mention that I used to do plant-based for two years, and it made me feel really, really good. I was super light. I felt super, super strong at the gym. I used to do intermittent fasting when I fast for 20 hours and eating for four hours. And it was also, I felt very light. I felt great. I looked great. However, really, really affected my mental health because I, the, the reason that I did it is because I couldn't trust myself with food. So now I'm just eating when I'm hungry. Literally, I'm starting to eat when I'm starting to get hungry. And I finish, I, I stop eating when I'm starting to get full. That's really the bottom line of mindful eating. And what I eat is I try to eat whole foods, plant-based, uh, non-plant-based. If I eat, like, chicken, I'll try to eat, like, organic and um, really clean products. So I can even eat, like, I don't know, like tortilla chips, but I'll, I'll make sure it's a clean brand that is actually clean in terms of ingredients, that everything that has uh, in the ingredient place, I can actually read and pronounce everything because if I can't, that means my body probably won't be able to read it as well, and then it causes cravings, it causes bloatiness, uncomfortable feelings, and also things in the long run. But usually I have, like on a regular day, I would say, like a basic day of, of me working and trying to just eating normally, I would have protein oats for breakfast. So it's going to be oats with protein powder and then some berries on top with, like, almond butter. And then for lunch, I will have some kind of sandwich uh, or a salad, um, more usually, like, lighter lunch. So I could have, like, a sandwich with, like, turkey and avocado and uh, some greens or with, like, hummus and chicken, whatever. And then for dinner, I'll have, like, a little more meal, like sweet potatoes with some kind of protein and uh, some veggies or I'll – Whatever I feel like, if I feel like making Thai food or Asian style like spaghetti or, you know, whatever, um, I really make sure that I give myself whatever, I don't restrict myself. Uh, so I found ways to really like create awesome recipes that are super simple and easy and, and healthy uh, in a very like creative way. So like I'll make like cheesecake out of tofu or brownies out of sweet potatoes or I'll make mac and cheese with like I'll create cheese from butternut squash I'll make like things like that oh man it sounds like some delicious stuff and as you mentioned earlier it's all about your approach is all about mindful eating and that's good because again you're not limiting yourself you you want to give yourself room or I should say wiggle room in order to eat the foods that you like but do it in a clean and a very healthy way I like that and Earlier, again, as we touched on the basis of food, you mentioned that when your first arrived, when you first came to America, you tried Mexican food. You said that you liked it, but you didn't get crazy over it. And the same thing with hamburgers. But I got to ask you, what are your favorite cheat meals? When you like indulging 
from time to time. What are your favorite cheat meals? It could be American. It could be some things maybe from your homeland in Israel. Oh, I I love my desserts. So I would love, I love like going get like a chocolate souffle with ice cream and, you know, something like that. But I do love, you know, every once in a while, it's very, very rare, but I would, I would crave like pizza or I would want like a real good burger, even though I don't, I, I do eat burgers. Like I make my own burgers uh, from, you know, like a, a better bun, like healthier bun. And, but, you know, sometimes I'll go out and I feel like having a burger and, and fries and, um, even though my choices of going out, like the places that I try to go out to, are generally going to be like more clean places and just like better ingredients. But um, yeah, and and also I would, you know, obviously if I'll go visit Israel or if there's like a good Israeli place, I will go and you know order some falafel, shawarma, and like a pita. You know, like that's also something that I love. Awesome, and then you know, as a part of fitness we touched on the training and the nutrition also vitamins and supplements they play a major role in what you currently do and i want to ask you what are some vitamins and supplements that you take yeah so there is this brand that i love that uh the reason i love them is because it's organic and it's super clean and there are so many supplements out there that are filled with literally crap sorry excuse my language but you know, they put color in their stuff. So I don't really, I, I wasn't really taking anything in terms of uh, supplements. I mean, for like pre-workouts, post-workouts, like electrolytes, protein powder, um, you know, immunity boost, uh, brain boost. They have a lot of like different different things. And it's called organic muscle. And yeah, it's like really, I, I never, never took uh, pre-workouts before until I found this brand because Usually pre, pre-workouts can give you the jitters. They have like a bunch of colors and artificial ingredients and like really, really unhealthy for the long run. Um, so when I found this, I was like, okay, cool. Now I can have like pre-workout because it's super clean. Uh, and when it comes to vitamins, I really suggest, and I, I did that myself, is to go to a doctor and get like a blood test to see what you're actually missing and just take whatever it is that you're missing because a lot of us just try to take like all these vitamins and supplements and it's just like overload to the liver and so what I do is just like literally take whatever it is I'm missing. So I know that I'm missing and most people do uh, vitamin D and I take biotin um, and other than that I don't really take, I mean I take some um, like ashwagandha mushrooms and you know some garlic and and turmeric and, and, you know, all the, the greens and the reds and, you know, the things that I mentioned from the company that I mentioned, uh, organic muscle. But, yeah, I just take, when it comes to vitamins, I just take what, what I'm actually missing. Okay. And I want to talk now about your brand, Hannah Healthy. Hannah Healthy is very vital. I should say it's very busy on the social media platforms, not just with your fitness coaching, but also with mindful eating and also protecting not only your physical health, but your mental health as well. Just tell everybody about Hannah Healthy and what's currently going on with the brand. Yes, I am basically doing, as at the moment, one-on-one coaching for people uh, that includes five pillars, which is the five pillars that I feel like everybody needs in order to get to their desired goal. And obviously, it's going to look a little bit different from one person to the other. Because we're all just different. We have different situations, different blood types, different genes, different hormones. We're, we're just different as humans, right? Different goals, obviously. And so the first thing is the nutrition, which is the mindful eating is like the base of it. And second thing is the training part, with, which is progressive overload. We always want to make sure that we progress in order to achieve the desired results. And that I do through a training app. Uh, so basically it's either at home or at the gym. And the third thing is the accountability part just to make sure, cause you know, you can have the perfect fitness program and the perfect nutrition program, but if you're not going to do it, you're not going to see the results. And that's why the accountability part is super important. Uh, the next thing is the education. So it's very, very, very important for me to educate people around fitness and nutrition and mindful eating because My goal is not just to get you to the desired goals. It's actually my only goal as a fitness coach is to help others to make it a sustainable, healthy, long-living, enjoyable lifestyle forever. So in order for you to achieve that, you have to understand the what and the why behind everything so you can connect to it better. 
So that's why the education for me, it's really, really important. And I do it by supporting and along the way with like education, like when they have any questions or uh, I have weekly calls around all certain topics uh, within my program for, you know, fitness, nutrition, mindful eating, even cooking and mindset and mental health and loving yourself and a lot of these like really, really important topics. And the last thing is the mental health part that I include that I see I found it be really important. It's something I added a little later, and it's because I had two clients uh, um, a year ago, and they were both in the same exact situation. They had exactly the same goals. So I, I gave them the, both the same fitness and nutrition program. One of them saw an amazing result after eight weeks. The other one did not see results. And, you know, I, I went on Zoom with her and I asked her, like, hey, okay, like, I see you're doing your fitness program. I see you're doing your nutrition. Like, why don't you see the results? Like, what do you tell yourself when you look in the mirror? And then she said things like, I'm never going to achieve my goals. I'm always going to stay fat. Really, like, a lot of limiting beliefs. And I was like, oh, my God, this is literally the only thing that we need to focus on. We need to change those limiting beliefs that you have in yourself. And when we change that, in two weeks, she started to see results just by working on that. And this is why I added also the mental health as well. Uh, currently, I'm working, like, my huge, my huge project for this year is to create an online uh, mindful eating course. And, you know, obviously, there's a lot of things on YouTube, uh, so really, like, hone in on YouTube more and just stay um, on YouTube uh, just consistently. And, uh, yeah, it's basically to help people to achieve lives that are healthy and free and enjoyable and uh, just be happy and and because you know it really affects everything it affects you show up for yourself first and when you show up for yourself best you can show up for your family for your kids you can show up for your clients you can show up for your business you can achieve a happy life and the way i see it is that we only on this earth like for living for such like limited amount of time it's not a long time like let's say 100 years it's not a long time so the, the the way i see it like why suffering you know why suffering with things that are not it's in our choice. We can choose if we want to restrict ourselves, but, you know, we can choose to be free also. So with those little things that, you know, there's enough suffering in the world. So at least when we go inward with what we're doing in our everyday life, we want to make sure that we're not suffering um, with our lifestyle because it's very important for our well-being and how we show up for everybody and for ourselves. Oh, man, that that's beautiful. I love that. And <laughs> you said it best. We're only here for... Only so many, only for uh, a certain amount of time. So we definitely have to make the most out of it while we're here, and not just from a physical standpoint, protecting our physical health, but most importantly, our mental and emotional health. And man, you really touched on some great points right there. And I want to stay just with your personal training business with Hannah Healthy, something that really affected everyone physically, mentally, and emotionally was the pandemic. And you mentioned earlier that you had to make the adjustment from going from in-person to giving instruction via Zoom. What were the biggest, what were the positives, say negatives, but I want to say what were the positives and what were the challenges of coordinating your personal training sessions via Zoom as opposed to being in person? Well, via Zoom, the challenges were the fact that just getting out of my comfort zone and do something that I'm not used to do because I used to go to the gym, you know, you know, come come to the gym and train someone and just the thing I know how like I know how to do, right? And all of a sudden in Zoom it's like it was challenging to getting out of that comfort zone, but it was really, really good. The positive like parts were really good because I realized that it's really simple, um to adjust as humans, just like we adjusted to the, you know, COVID and how the world looks different now than, than four years ago. And, you know, we just adjust, uh, we're just adjusting, right, as human beings. And uh, I feel like um, I, I just like the positive part is where that I can work from home and I can work from anywhere um, and just be more, um, yeah, just like work with people, reach more people, I guess you know, all, all over, all over the world. But that's with Zoom. But with what I do now, it's the online training, and that's, I feel like it's more, the positive is just, like, reaching more people, in, like, more people in general and have this, like, community and create that, like, community and support and uh, and uh, that, you know, when you go and train one-on-one at the gym, 
uh, you not necessarily have like a community per se. I mean, I guess it depends, but uh, you can't really do that if you work for the gym. And here I have my own clients and I put like we're all in a in a group and we're encouraging each other and there's a lot of support and accountability and uh, sharing recipes. So I feel like the sense of the community is something that's really, that I really tap into like lately. And I think it's really, really important, especially right now with with everything is happening in the world. And there's a lot of isolation that's being happening. And I think like the community and the support is something that's so important for not only our well-being, but also for, the way that we show up and succeed in our fitness journey and nutrition. That's wonderful. And tell everybody, Hannah, where they can find you on social media and any websites. Let them know that as well. Awesome. My Instagram is, the new Instagram that I have right now is Healthy. Hannah No H at the end. And on YouTube, it's Hannah Healthy Again, Hannah No H at the end. Um, I also have my uh, website, which is hannahealthy.com. So on my website, you'll have, like, a lot of links that are, you know, lead you to different things. I have, like, offer, I offer, like, um, um, a PDF with over 50 nutritious meals ideas. And, you know, there's some free resources that you could grab there. Uh, so hannahealthy.com, Hannah no H at the end. Awesome. And before we let you go, Hannah, do you have a message to anyone wanting to achieve their dreams? Because certainly not only have you continued to pursue the American dream, you've achieved many dreams and you're continuing to do so. And again, thank you so much for sharing about your upbringing, coming to America and getting involved with this fitness journey and the brand that you have. So the floor is yours. What message do you have to anyone wanting to achieve their dreams? Thank you so much. Um, the number one thing that I always will always say is always go back to yourself. Always go back to your heart. Always check in with yourself. Be honest with yourself what it is that you want to achieve first, and then just take it one day at a time. Uh, at a time, small steps. Like n- don't try to go from zero to a hundred because that's not gonna that's not gonna work. Like I'm I'm telling you from now. But I think it's the most important thing is always get connected to yourself. Because a lot of times there's like a lot of expectations or, you know, what people think about me or what, how an ideal body look like and just really check in with yourself and first of all identify what it is that you really want rather than what society tells us or what this person may think or may not think. It's always honor yourself and check in with yourself and connect to yourself. And there's ways to do it with like mindfulness. But uh, once you have that, I feel like everything becomes easier and just like, Everything becomes easier when you when it goes from the inside out rather than outside in because you can't make everyone happy. You can, you you can you you just cannot. It's just not going to happen. So that and then uh, take it one day at a time, small steps towards your 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 big goals. Awesome. Thank you for that for that uh, words of wisdom. And one more time, Hannah, give it give the left give the listeners. Your social media platforms. Yes, it's Hannah uh, uh, Hannah dot healthy on Instagram. Hannah no H at the end, and my website is hannahhealthy dot com. Uh, you can go to hannahhealthy dot com. Uh, Hannah no H at the end, and you can really find everything there. All my socials, my Facebook groups, my free resources. You can book a call, and everything can be there. You heard it from her, Hannah Stone. She is the founder and the CEO of the Hannah Healthy brand, giving people the opportunity to incorporate a better lifestyle, a healthier lifestyle through fitness, mental, and physical health, and, of course, mindful eating. Hannah, thank you so much again for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. If ever you want to come back on the program, feel free to let us know. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for another exciting edition of The Robinson Show. Once again, a big special thank you to Hannah Stone, owner, founder, and CEO of Hannah Healthy. It's a brand specializing in fitness, nutrition, and maintaining physical and mental health. Once again, a big special thank you to Hannah for appearing on the program and just giving us her amazing story. And until next time, remember, put God first in everything you do and you can't go wrong. Until next time, stick to the strip. I'm out. Peace.